Africa, there's a cuckoo. Sings on the hot days in the midst of the forest, like the sonorous heartbeat of the world. I never had the luck to see her. Nor could anyone tell me how she looked. Miss Abu. How can I tell you my cuckoo story? Or the stories of those I did see and loved through tears and laughter, now clay within the clay of Africa? And can the green and golden threads of paradise on earth be rewoven like an ancient tapestry with words alone? I think of Penelope waiting for Ulysses, weaving her own Eden, until she felt such guilty joy that each night she unpicked it, leaving no trace of her creation. Miss Abu. So it is with me. I sit here in Ronstadtlon, my Danish estate, looking through the little casement window over a bitter Baltic sea, torn between loss and laughter. But you would tease and goad me, so I shall order my garden of memories as best I can, ready for your return. Knowing that memories have no order, and that you will never return. Once upon a time, on my farm in Africa, the three long windows of the dining room were often open to the terrace, lawn, and on down to the forest and the river. My Kikuyu houseboys often gathered here after supper near me to watch the working of the typewriter. One particularly clever and job-like boy called Camante comes in from his kitchen kingdom and stands, hands behind his back, for an hour, his eyes running to and fro as if he means to take the machine to pieces and put it together again. Miss Abu. Yes, Kamante. Do you believe yourself that you can write this book? Not if you make me talk now. I don't know. I do not know if I can write this book. Kamante, master of the pause, like all Africans, holds his silence. Then... I do not believe it. Why don't you believe it? As I suspect, he has prepared for this conversation and holds the odyssey itself behind his back, which he now brings forward to lay on the table as his chief witness. It is a marvellous coup de théâtre. Look, Miss Abu, this is a good book. It hangs together from this end to this end. And look, even if you hold it up and shake it strongly like ah, this... Come on, say, this is Sabu Bedar's book. Bedar, the bold one, was the name for Dennis. No, the Sabu who made this book is dead now. See? This does not come to pieces. This book you write on the table, when these foolish boys forget to close the door, it pours about, even down to the floor, and you are angry. Sometimes, Msabu, you throw the papers on the floor. This book will not be a good book. No, you're right, Kamante. This is no good. But when all the words are on the pages in the right order, there are people in Europe able, if they like the pages enough, to fix them all up together. Yes? Yes. Miss Abu, what is it in this book? Have you got a story for me, Tanya? Dennis would say, lying on the carpet by my fire, having returned from another safari. My name is Karen. I was Tanya to him, because my family called me Tanna. For him I became Scheherazade. And here I am again, telling tales for my very life. You would not have to kill me with hanging, though like the Sharia, his 3,000 wives. You would only have to leave and not come back. What is it in these books? I tell him the story from the Odyssey of Odysseus and Polyphemus and of how Odysseus calls himself no man and puts out the giant's only eye and escapes under the belly of a ram. 
The great joke here being, I explained, that when Polyphemus shouts for his fellow giants to avenge him, and they ask who it is they should hunt, he replies, No man. When I finish, instead of laughing, he considers deeply, then asks, And is this giant a black man, like the Kikuyu? And is Odysseus a white man, like Sabu Beda? No, well... They are both Greeks, I suppose. How does this giant say the word no man in this Greek language? Say it. He says, Utis. And this is the story you must write, Miss Abu. Oh, no. I'm trying to write some stories I heard as a child in Denmark. But I can write of anything. I might write of you, Commander. What part of me will you write of? I might write about the time when I found you, and you were small, and your leg was covered in ulcers, and you were out all alone in the plain with the sheep. What did you think of then? His eyes wander over the room, up and down. In the end he says, vaguely, Say, Dewey. I know not. Were you afraid? Yes. All the boys on the plane are afraid sometimes. Of what were you afraid? Of Utis. The boys on the plane are afraid of Utis. Am I too struggling with how to tell my story? Afraid of no man. I imagine Odysseus, the hero, returning home unexpectedly, pulling off his boots and crying, as Dennis did. Have you got a story for me? Once upon a time, my father, Wilhelm Dinesen, was home from his many travels. He was an officer in the Danish and French armies, a passionate, restless and melancholy man. He talked more with me than anyone. Love of war is a passion like any other done. You love your soldiers as you love young women folk, to madness. And, of course, the one love does not exclude the other. When he was not away in Paris or America or Copenhagen, he would philosophize to me on our long walks together by the sound. Love and peace, hate, persecute and annihilate each other, Dan. Experience is all, always. Any joy, any sorrow, anything, anything but stagnation. Bear everything you can until you break. Then bear some more. I believed myself to be my father's dearest confidant, consolation and solace. And I worshipped him. Of course. Love is about one coin. Two sides, Tan. Never a mirror. Never look in one mirror and grieve when it breaks. Whatever happens, each moment requires another mask, another action, and laughter. <laughs> Laugh, Tan. <laughs> and then, when I was nine, my father hanged himself in the room of a boarding house in Copenhagen. What happens next? When I am old enough, I marry my lover's brother, second cousin Bruhr, Baron Bruhr von Blixenfinica, Blix to his hunting and drinking companions. On our engagement, which is brief, Bruhr and I buy grazing land in Africa with, of course, borrowed money. Ah, <laughs> oh, what business did I have to set my heart on the dark earth of Africa, you ask? What is Africa to me or me to Africa? Oh, then, simply not Denmark. In 1913, I pack up my little German cuckoo clock, my tables and chairs, my gowns, my limoges, my crystal glasses, 
and my notebooks full of childish stories and take the boat south. My Vita Nuova, my real life, begins when we call at Aden. Mem Sahib, Karen? This dark-eyed, dark-skinned Somali is just my height. And so far as we could ever tell, just my age. Courtly. But with the gaze of a falcon calculating his prey, he has a look which, like equator sun, can make the European slightly dizzy. I am Baroness von Blixen. Where is Brewer? Mem Sahib Ker. This Sahib is waiting in Mombasa for the wedding. I am here. And you are? Farah Arden, Mem Sahib. Come to superintend my baggage. Or as it will always be now, our baggage. Our china, our clock, our cut glass, our farm, our money, our books, our life. So, Farah Arden, what happens next? This Mem Sahib must go to be married now at Mombasa. And then? And then we go to this farm. And there it is, all at the stroke. I, a mere cuckoo in the great nest of Africa and a stranger stars, have a Somali servant, a husband, a title, and I have a farm in Africa. From my dining room in the evening, where I often sat listening to time passing, I would see the heads of children approaching the house from all sides, swimming through the bush and long grass like the heads of frogs in a pond. In a very short time, Farah would arrive at my door. Mem Sahib, these totals wish to come inside and see the wooden cuckoo. These totals are very foolish and think it is alive. I tell them this bird is dead and they nod at me. But still they come. Farah and I, together running the daily life of the farm, know a clock is entirely an object of luxury in the African highlands. All year round, you can tell from the position of the sun what the time is. But the totos come like those under a spell to pay evening court to its hourly nativity. Let them come in, Farah. They enter noiselessly on bare feet with the breaths of wind and weight standing like storks on one foot, heads to one side. Nothing happens. And then... They laugh. And I feel my heart leaping from my silence into expansion, such as an eagle must feel, springing from a tumbling cliff to soar in free air. The children are me. The grass is me. The ridiculous painted bird, mouth agape is me. The distant visible mountains like innumerable waves are me. Here I am where I ought to be. Ngong Mountain stretches in a long ridge. Four noble peaks, darker blue against the sky. Between my farm and the hills, lay the plains and woods and deserts of Africa, an infinitely precious Persian carpet in the dyes of green, yellow and black-brown, patterned like a mystery we almost remember. I would ride into this enchanted world with my manservant Farah on Sundays and sometimes take small safari journeys and camp overnight to see the first moments of life at daybreak. Giraffe, progressing across the plain in their queer, inimitable vegetative gracefulness like long-stemmed, speckled, gigantic flowers slowly advancing. My first lion, royal before sunrise, below a waning moon, drawing a dark wake in the silvery grass, his face still red from his kill. 
Unlike my patient-eyed and suffering oxen on the farm, I had seen a herd of wild buffalo leaving the morning mist one by one, 129 of them, as though they were being created before my eyes and sent out as they were finished. As it was in Eden. God is great, Mem Sahib. Indeed he is, Farah. And he is great just at this moment, because... On the principle that Farah, as a devout Muslim, and one of the people of the book, believe that whatever happens, this is the best thing, he might have been talking philosophically about some personal or general catastrophe. And it was important to feel one's ground. Because this morning, Mem Sahib, Lulu has returned. Kamante has <sighs> met her himself in the garden and fed her corn from his hand. Oh, then God is both great, Farah, and merciful. This news has made me very happy, very happy. The princess isn't dead and has not forgotten her people. I thought never to see her again. <laughs> Let's go home! Lulu came to my house from the woods, as Kamante had come to it from the plains. I named her Lulu when Kamante told me this was Swahili for pearl, because not only was she infinitely pure, small and precious, she came from a part of the forest so mysterious that often, when riding out in it, we seemed to be moving under water. The first time I met Lulu, before indeed she was Lulu, Farah and I had been having one of our showeries, a standoff around matters relating to money and his right to deny me any extravagance he thought unreasonable. What do you want these five rupees for, Mem Sahib? Riding boots. These are finished, you can see, and I, I can't wait for the ones I ordered, Farah. Mem Sahib, I pray to God that these riding boots may last till new ones arrive out of London. Farah knew he would win this showery, as so many others, because apart from our shared knowledge of how few rupees there were to spend, his pride was even greater than mine. I did not want to be seen by anyone in shabby boots, but Farah felt it below my dignity, and more importantly his, to walk out in one's maid in Nairobi. Mem Sahib, these totos are bringing something to show us. These totos do not come from this farm. Shall I, what is your word, shoo them? What is it they have there? Is, is it alive? I think that it is a bushback. Very young, too small to eat. Chase them away. Everybody, shoo. Bara, you must shoo. see that I must have these boots soon or people will laugh at me. And they will laugh at you. That night I was woken by a great feeling of terror and an image of the fawn in careless hands, hanging from its pencil-thin bound legs. Rising in panic, I raised up all my houseboys, and like a queen in a fairy tale, threatening beheading, said I would dismiss them if the fawn wasn't found, and brought to me by morning. And very early next morning, when a tight-lipped Farah brought me tea, the Daphne of the woods I had so cruelly abandoned as a sacrifice to sartorial vanity, was carried to me, still miraculously alive, in Camante's arms. From that first moment, Lulu ruled the house, conquering everyone within, starting with my dear hounds. The arrogance of these great hunters was like water with her. I had tied a bell around her neck, and when they heard it approaching, they moved resignedly aside while she took their milk or special warm places by the fire. Her diminutive hoofs gave her the air of a young Chinese lady of the old school with laced feet. And the polished floors were at first a problem in her life. When she got outside the carpets, her legs went away from her to all four sides. It looked catastrophic, but she did not let it worry her much, and in the end learned to walk on the bare floors with a sound like an angry succession of finger taps. 
Camante brought her up on a sucking bottle and shut her away at night from the leopards. So she held to him and followed him about, giving his thin legs a butt when he did not do what she wanted at once. When I stopped her from doing anything she wanted to do, she behaved as if she was saying, Oh, anything rather than a scene. But the devil was in her, and when the spirit came upon her... Let her out, for God's sake! Come on, open the French windows. Let her get out! This creature should not be in the house, Mem Sahib. This creature belongs outside, now! We will have nothing to show your friends when they come and ask for wine and supper. Come on, has she gone? Is she hurt? Why are you laughing? What is it? Look, Miss Abu, Lulu is dancing. She is dancing on the garden. Lulu is dancing this war dance. You better come and see. And on the grass, Lulu was leaping a zigzagged prayer to Satan himself, throwing her head to beat her sunset copper shoulders against invisible obstacles she seemed to feel we had set up around her, like castle walls too high for her to jump. She looks so angry. Why is she so angry? She is angry with us. But we worship her. We look after her. We give her everything she wants. This is why, Miss Abu. Why doesn't she run away, Commander, if she is so angry with us? Soon she will grow into herself, Miss Abu. Then she will go into the forest and be a real bushback. And find another bushback and be married. Make haste, my beloved. And be thou like to a roe or to a young heart upon the mountains of spices. <laughs> the house will seem so empty without her. Yes, Miss Abu. Doesn't that make you sad? Yes, Miss Abu. And happy. But all this was not the story I had imagined in Denmark. The story of my life in Africa was going to be this, you understand. We were to have a cattle farm. Dairy. That being, together with piracy on the high seas, what Danes knew best. We were to be a fine and happy couple, my Swedish baron Broer von Blixen and myself, growing rich and wise together, farming and shooting, returning home every night to an army of servants, serving miraculous dinners and ambrosial wine in my Limoges porcelain and crystal glasses to fascinating guests. We would breed four or five happy, rich, clever children. None of these things happened. Of course. Juan? Sabu. We're planting coffee, Tana. Did I tell you? There are no fortunes made in stock rearing at the moment. Everyone at the club says. Juma? Yes, Miss Abu. Coffee's going to be Kenya's gold. Coffee is the only thing that has a future. The world is crying out for Kenyan coffee, Tano. We agreed, cattle, brewer. Cattle is what you and I know. Oh, cattle tie you down. Coffee only needs to be left to grow. Oh, nothing grows when left alone but weeds and misery. We'll hire a manager to do the work. You'll see. Wages, brewer. We have no more money. And there's the Kikuyu. They work for no wages on the land. You can entertain and ride and shoot like at home. You mean you can spend all your time riding and shooting and being entertained in Nairobi? And our marriage? Is that to be just left to grow too? Hmm. It wasn't what we agreed, Bro. Things change. You haven't changed. You're afraid to grow up. My family invested their money in cattle. They're not rich. No. So your family invested in a title for you. It's a good bargain, I think. Huh? Don't be angry, Tana. We'll stay friends. And we'll call it the Curran Coffee Company. How long? How long what? How long before our first crop? Three, maybe four years. Come on, Tana, this is an adventure. Lighten up, as Finch Hutton would say. Laugh, Tanya. So, while this Tanna, this Karen, now Rumpelstiltskin, nurtured our new enterprise, trusting the unpromising sticks my Kikuyu and I pushed into the ground would turn overnight to gold, Brewer took his rifles on safari. 
or stayed in Nairobi at the Musaiga Club, affectionately known as Africa's Moulin Rouge, expensively dedicated to undermining his good health and joie de vivre, but never quite succeeding. His charm still charmed, and his syphilis proved mild. Mine was not, and required a trip home for almost lethal doses of salvasin, also known as arsenic, which rendered me unable to charm for quite a while, and unable to conceive at all. Like Rumpelstiltskin, I longed for and loved children. And like Scheherazade, I longed for and wanted to belong to a single man at any cost. Neither wish was to be granted. God is great. I might say the world being as it is, Brewer had a point. It was probably worthwhile having syphilis in order to become a baroness, and worthwhile losing a husband in order to rule his kingdom on my own. Laugh, Tanya. Why did you think we should not see Lulu again, Mem Sahib? Why? Oh, I thought of the leopards by the pond, gunshots in the night, fire in the forest, so many things. She did not go to die, Mem Sahib. She went to be married, as Kamante told you she would. She has her own life now. Lulu is here, Miss Abu, with her Toto. And her Toto is not afraid of the dogs either. Her Bawana dares not come. He is by the trees, see? He is afraid. Every morning he thinks that today he will come all the way, but when he sees the house and the people, he gets a cold stone in his stomach. I felt this free union between my house and the antelope's wild home was a rare and marvelous thing, a deep blessing, and a message to me from the very heart of Africa. To my greatest friends, Barclay Cole and Dennis Finch Hatton, my farm was a communist establishment, everything in common and a still point for their wanderings. It owed its charm to the fact that it and I appeared stationary and unchanging, where I dreamed of sitting by safari campfires in the bush. They dreamed of my log fire with its rugs and Chinese screen and the store of wine they always left with me. Dennis had a trait of character which to me was very precious. He liked to hear a story told. As a hunter of game, he lived much by the ear. Fashions have changed, and the art of storytelling, so precious to the South and Eastern world still, has been lost in Europe. But I always felt I might have cut a figure as a wandering spinner of yarns. Time for our story, Tanya. Oh. Dennis would say stretched on the carpet by my fire, having returned from another safari. You must practice your English. Why must I practice my English? It is superb. <laughs> is it not, Barclay? Superb. <laughs> because it's not superb enough for publication yet. You must publish in English to make money. How is your Danish? Ah, show me a Danish empire and I'll tell you. Mm. We had an empire once. Then we grew up. <laughs> You and Germany will always be having these Homeric wars, like the one you're having now, but oh. nothing but family squabbles and an excess of young men who kill things and spoil the coffee trade. You like to kill things too? Hush now, Dennis. Baroness, do indulge us. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a man who came here, slept one night, and walked off, never to return. Huh? Hmm. His name was Emanuelsen, a Swede and maitre d'hôtel in Nairobi. 
A fattish young man with a red puff face. He was known to have a gift for bringing himself into trouble with other men. I had heard Nairobi gossip, in fact, that he had been arrested for. Indecency, or insolvency, or both. But <laughs> soon after I heard this, I rode home under the stars to find him waiting outside my house. I thought it was one of you. Who's there? Barclay? Dennis? Ah, good. Uh, just before the absolute dark, <laughs> uh, here comes a vagabond baroness who has lost his way uh, to greet you as to the blessed hearth and home you ride hey, man, with angels sent. strong to guide. <laughs> I heard you were in prison. Oh, indeed, I was. A friend in the ministry arranged for myself to be, I think, to save himself some embarrassment, uh, accidentally opened, should I say, and here I am. Here you are, but where are you going? Farah, take my horse, please. If you tell me to do this, Mim Saib. I do. <laughs> the servant does not like me to be here. He has been my silent shadow these two whole hours, keeping me outside your door. Though it's uh, getting damn cold, don't you think? I, I will not trouble you long, Baroness. I go to Tanganyika. I came while it was still light for you to set me on the path. Tonight? How will you do this? Uh, as you see, a, a walking. That's three or four days and nights across the Maasai Reserve and in a drought. The watering holes are empty that way and the lions are bad just now, hungry. Uh, I too, Baroness, and now it is dark. I fear starting till morning. Uh, perhaps... Through your legendary kindness to guests, I might rest and prepare for the ordeal and ask to bear your company for dinner and sleep, eh? And set out at sunrise? <clears throat> uh, but you are out and now are tired, and I think even if you press me, I must go forward while I am resolved. He was speaking his odd English in a hearty manner to save his own face and mine when I refused him, as I was about to. But then I thought how this was great courtesy in a hunted animal. And how there might be a story for you in it. You, you took him in? <laughs> Life on the farm can be very lonely between your visits, gentlemen. What if he'd robbed you? Robbed me of what? Uh, so, so, what happened? I invited him in for supper. I ordered Juma to bring extra food and wine. Emma Nielsen tasted and examined the wine like a person listening to music with absolute attention. As you do, Barclay. Farmer. Farmer. A Kenyan farm in the middle of a war and we drink Chambertin 1906. Hmm. It is a miracle. What have you been doing, Emanuelsen, outside Africa? What are you? Mm, an actor. I was once stupendous as Oswald and Ghosts. You have not, by any chance, got the plays of Henry Gibson here. Then we might do the last scene together. Alas, I had not got the plays of Henry Gibson. Do you believe in God, Emanuelsen? Mm, yes, yes, yes. Then, a silence, worthy of Camante. Perhaps you will think me a terrible pedant and heretic, Baroness, if I now say what I'm going to say. But, with the exception of God, I believe in absolutely nothing whatever. Not the devil? No, it is the same. Spoken like Kierkegaard, or any of my Africans. There are no philosophers in Africa, Baroness, surely. I have found all Africans to be philosophers. Every Toto knows by nature what Kierkegaard struggled to understand all his life. In Africa, it seems to me that imagination is one with appearance. And even death doesn't break that connection. Farah, my good shadow, Kamante, who cooks this sauce, by the way, mm. and Juma here, waiting to top up your glass, they are all like 
fishes in deep water, which for the life of them cannot understand our European fear of drowning. This assurance, this art of swimming, I think they have, because they haven't lost the knowledge, as you have just said, that good and evil are one. Look here, Emanuelson. Hmm? Have you got any money? Oh, yes, yes. Eighty cents. Oh, that's not enough. I keep no money in the house. But perhaps Farah will have some. Four rupees, Sahib. These I will fetch. He had earned our respect. And so next morning I myself make our guest up a parcel of sandwiches and hard-boiled eggs. And with it... A bottle of the Chambatan 1906. Oh. Because he knew it, Barpi. It was his as much as yours or mine, and it was certain to be the last drink of his life. Maybe the last drink of mine. <laughs> Farah and I drove him the first ten miles. It was no advantage since he had another eighty to walk. But I think he was pleased to have an audience. The dramatic instinct in him was so strong that he was at this moment vividly aware of leaving the stage, of disappearing, as if he had, with the eyes of Farah and me, seen himself go. Is that not why God created us to play our parts well? Exit Emanuelson. Where is that Buana going, Mem Sahib? Tanganyika. On foot? Allah be with him. Uh, and was Allah with him? Half a year later, a registered letter arrived to me from Dodoma. It contained Farah's four rupees and a charming letter. Another miracle? Perhaps, in a way. Three miles down the road, he got a lift from an Indian lorry. <laughs> His only suffering, therefore, he wrote, was having to share his sandwiches and his wine with the driver. But my dear Finch had his survival was hardly the point of the story. This Emmanuel Sunday. Tell him, Baroness. Step from the edge of his life into thin air, without wings, into the story that life had given him. And he did this with honour and style. Was it his fault an angel caught him as he fell? No, well, no, I, I didn't get that out of the story. It's true. If you were offered a pair of real wings to saw off the edge of your life, but which could never be laid off, would you accept the offer or decline? Dennis? No, there's nothing I'd like better. Tanya? I suppose if I were a lady, I'd need to think it over. Juma, more, please. Mm. Dennis and Barclay had been over vast countries and raced and broken many tents in many places and were pleased to round my drive, steadfast as the orbit of a star. Tanya! We're starving! Did you teach Comante to make an omelette a la chasseur? Has he learned yet? That the dessert comes after the fish and meat? <laughs> oh, uh, have the Petrushka records come? Yes, I did. No, Barclay, oh. I have learned to draw Comante pictures of the dishes in their order, and yes, they have. Yeah, why are you still playing Beethoven? Don't we like Beethoven now? Well, we would like him, all right, if he weren't vulgar. Ah, here it is. And what does Comante call his omelette, Baroness? The dish of the grey horse that died. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Camante's memory for recipes was prodigious. His technique for identifying them was idiosyncratic through some event which had taken place on the day they had been shown him. I was much interested in cookery myself, but Camante's whites of egg towered over mine like light clouds, even though he left my whisk to rust and used only his weeding knife. And the meals we conjured together were so many... Banquets of Prospero. Coffee, Sahib. Ah, thank you, Farah. Are you well? Very well, Sahib. Good. Fine. Fine. So very fine. Yes, perfect. Ah, this is the place to be. Hmm. There has only ever been one 
shadow here, Baroness. Forgive me if I mention it in anticipation of tomorrow. That you always order our morning bottle of champagne under the trees to be served in coarse lemonade glasses. Oh, but, Barclay, I have so few of my good glasses left, and the boys will break them when they have to carry them such a long way. But, my dear, it has been so sad. Farah. Yes, Mem Sahib. Tomorrow morning, our best glasses will be brought to the forest with our champagne. Ah, <laughs> see, Barclay. Farah's heart speaks. Yes. He has always been of your opinion. You may leave us now, Farah. Thank you, Mem Sahib. Sahib? Have you got a story, Tanya? Dennis would always say. Yes, yes, a story. How long are you staying this time? Until tomorrow afternoon. Oh. No time to lose, then. Shall we go to the fire, gentlemen? And there I went, to tell tales for my very life. Trying not to fear there might be a time when another man who came here and slept here would also walk away, never to return. When the Great War touched Africa, and we were left alone by all the white men going to the borders to fight one another, the white women were threatened with a concentration camp to protect them from danger. I knew I would die in such a camp, as wild animals in a crate, or Maasai in prison can die at will. My wandering husband, Brewer, at that moment, sent a message detailing supplies to be carried to his army camp at once. And when a man I hired to take the ox wagons was arrested the night before as a German, though he was not a German, I made this one adventure in the world of men my own adventure, mine and Farah's. We travelled for three months, and the air of the African highlands went to my head like wine. I was all the time drunk with it, and with the joy, indescribable joy. Safe in the wilderness from a civilization to which none of us felt we belonged, Farah and Ismail, my gun bearer, found their tongues loosened around the fire each night, delighting me with tales from the Arabian Nights or the Koran, or explaining their own Somali myths of the Red Sea, while new constellations of stars, and often a shooting star, passed over our heads. Like we Danes, the Somali were great sea pirates of old. Every creature, Mem Sahib, on this earth lives in the same shape underwater too. Horses, lions, giraffes, women, mares and foals of great swiftness, yeah. living on blue sands, deep, deep in dark. Yes, yes, yes. they have been seen, yes. But they come up to the grassland on nights of the full moon to populate. Excuse me, men, sai. <laughs> and so at times, even though life on the farm was very lonely, and in the stillness of the evenings, when the minutes dripped from the clock, my life seemed to be dripping away with them, I always felt the presence of my Africans running parallel with my own, on a different plane, Echoes passing like sonar between us. The natives were Africa, in flesh and blood, and so I loved them. Dennis Finchhatton had no other home in Africa, but he came only when he wanted to come. He taught me Latin, and to read the Bible and the Greek poets. He also gave me my gramophone. This became the voice of the farm to me, its song promising a resurgence of friendship and joy. Sometimes he would arrive unexpectedly while I was out in the coffee field and set the gramophone going. As I came riding back, the melody streamed towards me in the cool, clear air to announce his presence, as if he were laughing at me, which he often did. Hello, Tanya. Where have you been? Hello, Dennis. Farah, who are these? Masai, Mem Sahib. Masai are like lions, 
untamable creatures of the plains. I had never seen one at my farm except Dennis's gun bearer, Canothia, who stood, as always, a long way off from our group. These Masai say their cattle are being killed by this lioness, Mem Sahib. And you must come and shoot her. She never sees a lion unless I'm with her, Farah. Already Sahib Bedar has said yes. Already I've said yes. Kamante knows this supper will be breakfast, and I'm putting it in the car. We drove a long way, towards the liquid early morning. The air was dark, deep water, and our car ran like some sluggish electric eel, quietly along the bottom of the sea. See how large the stars are? That's because they're not real stars. I know. They're reflections on the surface of the water. This track is on the bottom of the sea. <laughs> Smell the brine. <sighs> That's burnt grass. Wait. Do you hear? Yes. It was a big dead giraffe bull, shot days before by poachers. Upon the huge carcass of the giraffe, a lioness had been feeding, and now raised her bloodied head to look at us. Well, Tan, shall I shoot her? I nod, tongue-tied. Canothia lifts her rifle off his shoulder as we get down from the car and passes it to Dennis. Stay here. No. Come on, then. Let's both risk our lives unnecessarily. And as we both move forward, the shot falls close to me, as if it had been thunder, as if I myself had been shifted into the place of the lion. I run to her side, and she lies dead in a black pool. Move on. Look sharp. Here's the second lion before me, torn between flight and attack. A lock of his golden mane lifted by the morning wind. You shoot this time. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Dennis and Canothia pull up their sleeves, light a fire, and while the sun rises, they skin the lions. When they take a rest, we have a bottle of claret and raisins and almonds, because it is New Year's Day. The dead lions nearby are glorious in their red, écorché nakedness. Not a particle of superfluous flat on them, each muscle a bold, controlled curve. They need no cloak. They are all through what they ought to be. As we sit there in silent content, Dennis eating an orange, a shadow hastens over the grass and over my feet. And looking up, I see, high in the light blue sky, the circling of vultures. It's clean. The way the Africans bring their bodies out here for the vultures and hyenas to deal with them. They'll make us be buried, I suppose. But where? I don't mind being buried in Africa, do you? Here then, I suppose. Or there, look. Up there on that first ridge. <laughs> Let's at least have a view. Will that do? We'll see the farm from there. Did you not want to be taken home? I am home. It was a curious thing about Barclay and Dennis, who were so deeply regretted by their friends in England and so much beloved in the colony that they should be all the same outcasts. It was not society or a place that had thrown them out, but time had done it. They did not belong to their century. Dennis, I felt, would have been dear to the Elizabethans as an athlete, musician and lover of art. Barclay, if he had had his small head enriched with a wig of long, silky curls, could have walked in and out of the court of King Charles II as court jester. He walked noiseless as a cat and like a cat made every room he sat in a place of comfort. When Barclay died of black water fever, in the arms of his Somali lover, an epoch in the history of the colony came to an end. A presence of gracefulness, gaiety and freedom had gone. A cat had left the room. 
Oh, Dennis Finch Hatton, I owe what was, I think, the greatest, the most transporting pleasure of my life on the farm. I flew with him over Africa. The visions were a marvel, but it was the activity which makes one happy, and the joy and glory of the flyer is the flight itself. So Dennis taught me. The air squeezed my forehead, as cold as ice water. All my hair flew backwards, as though my head were being pulled off. And when you are sitting in front of your pilot with nothing but space before you, you feel that he is carrying you upon the outstretched palms of his hands, as the djinn carried Prince Ali through the air, and that the wings that bear you onward are his. Do you care to come to Naivasha, Tanya? The country lying between is very rough. We couldn't possibly land anywhere on the way. We'll have to go up to 12,000 feet and keep there. You won't see much. When there was no time for long flights, we may do with short ones over the Ngong Hills, over our gravesite, especially wonderful at sunset. The buffalo are out feeding, Tanya. Come and have a look at them. I can't come. I've got a tea party up at the house. But we can go and see them and be back in quarter of an hour. When I came back to my tea party, the teapot on the stone table was still so hot that I burned my fingers on it. In the Yungong Hills, there lived a pair of eagles. They spent their life up in the air. We chased one of these eagles very high one day, careening and throwing ourselves onto one wing and then to the other. And I believe that the sharp-sighted bird played with us. As soon as we were running side by side, Dennis stopped his engine in mid-air, and as he did so, I heard the eagle screech. Ismail came and talked to us when we landed on the plain of the farm. You, you were up very high today, Msabu. We could not see you, only hear the aeroplane singing like a bee. Did you see God? Uh, no, Ismail, we, we did not see God. Ah, ah, ah. Th then you were not up high enough. But n now tell me, do you think that you will be able to get up high enough to see him? I don't know, Ismail. <laughs> and you, Bedar? What do you think? Will you get up high enough one day in this yellow locust to see God? Really? I have no idea. Then I do not know at all why you two go on flying. I had a farm in Africa, at the foot of the Ungong Hills, a little too high for coffee. Nights were cold, but in the daytime you felt you had soared upwards, dangerously near the sun, like Icarus. Misabu. Our machinery was never quite as it should have been. Once the whole factory burned down and had to be built up again, after this, the Kikuyu had a deep and rational respect for fire. Misabu. One night, Kamante suddenly walked into my bedroom with a hurricane lamp and spoke very solemnly. Misabu, I think you better get up. I think that God is coming. So I get up and see, from the door windows, a big grass fire, burning from hilltop to the plain in an almost vertical line, as though some gigantic figure, some terrible blinded Polyphemus, is moving towards us. I explained the whole thing to Comante, for I felt he had been terribly frightened. But he does not seem afraid, or to care about the explanation. He clearly feels his mission is accomplished. Well, yes, it may be so, but I thought you had better get up in case God was coming. Farah! Farah, where is he? Farah! He's here, Mem Sahib. Farah, outside on the gravel is a chameleon. Please kill it. Kill it at once. I, I picked up a stone. I couldn't. Well, why must this chameleon be killed, Mem Sahib? No, no, no. Take my rifle. It will be cleaner. Tell someone to why? go and kill it. Mem Sahib, sit down. She met Fatima's big white cockerel, and she changed color. She changed so many colors. She was frightened, but she was brave. She planted her feet on the ground, 
opened her mouth as wide as she could and stuck her tongue right out. What happens to this chameleon? The bird's beak struck down like a hammer. It tore her tongue out from the root. Without her tongue, she cannot eat. Without her tongue, she cannot live. Juma, go do this thing. I am going, Miss Abu. Farah, I was so desperate. I asked for a sign. I went out looking for one. God is laughing at us. Perhaps, Mem Sahib. But this is a great mercy. It's all my fault. I would give all I had if that chameleon was still alive and had its tongue. Mem Sahib, we have nothing left to give now. Everything is sold. I pray every night these old shoes will last until you get to Paris. <laughs> I feel like it isn't me who's leaving, Vara, but Africa herself. Even you in your finest clothes are withdrawing from me like waves at that tide. You look like a man who came to meet me once in Aden. I am this man. <laughs> I'm seeing you again for the first time. And soon for the last time. Now, how will it be not to see you every day? Like being blind. I shall light this fire and lay this table and walk beside you every day, Mem Sahib, until I die. <sighs> this chameleon is with God now, Mem Sahib, and this is good. The mercy is in you, seeing his tongue bitten off, that you could command for him a quick death and not a slow one. My skull feels empty as this room, Farah. It is better like this, like a Somali tent. We can watch the moon rise and the sun setting better now. Dear friend, you're right. This is how we should have had it all the time. We were already heavily in debt, thanks to the war and other troubles. And fearful of the future, I was driven to walking out at night. Farah alone knew of my night walks. I have seen leopards, Mem Sahib, close to this house when the sun is down. But still I went out, like a ghost that is set to walk. And he used to stand on the veranda, a white-robed figure, just visible in the dark until I came home again. I thought up many devices to make money. We can have cattle, Farah. That was what we intended from the first. This land is not clean, Mem Sahib. It has East Coast fever. Then the grasshoppers came. One afternoon, I was riding over to Aduka, our farm shop, when Kamante hobbled towards me. But for his sense of dignity, he might have been running. Please, Miss Abu. The grasshoppers are coming now to us. I have been told so many times, Commander. Turn around, Miss Abu. I turned around and saw a shadow on the sky along the northern horizon like a town burning, like a million people city or a great genie vomiting smoke into the bright air. What is that? Miss Abu, grasshoppers. For twelve hours, they hurled themselves around us, whistling and shrieking like a Sirocco wind, shining round my head like thin blades of steel in the sun, but themselves darkening the sun. In the end, they left us, but they had laid eggs in the soil. Next year, after the long rains, they would hatch as crawling hoppers and eat up everything in sight. During my last months in Africa, with the war all around me, when everything was going wrong with me, my isolation and sense of guilt at my failure sometimes suddenly fell upon me like a darkness. And I became frightened of this darkness as a sort of derangement. Dennis Finchhatton would come in from one of his safaris and sit with me a while on the packing cases. 
I've spent days in Nairobi sitting outside closed doors to offices, waiting to beg for the Kikuyu to stay in their village. They need for me to make them a home here when I've gone. I must do this, Dennis, or they will die. Nonsense. They must fend for themselves. We all must, in the end. I can't bear to see all this. This breaking up and packing. What can I do? What? No. Would you like to move to Takaunga? I'm thinking of making Takaunga my new base. And starting the safaris from there. Farah would like that. Dennis owned a piece of land on the coast, north of Mombasa, near the ruins of an old Arab settlement, which had a very modest, ruined minaret. No white person could survive the summers there. The cuckoo clock's still here anyway. I thought I might leave the clock for the Toto, who still sings a love song to it every night. <laughs> you must laugh, Tanya. All things pass. Come. Let's have a story. <sighs> Once upon a time, I was staying in Mombasa in the house of Sheikh Ali bin Bedar. <laughs> While I stayed there, a rusty German steamer was in harbour, homeward bound with cargo from the interior. On the deck there stood a tall wooden case, and above the lip of the case there rose the heads of two giraffes. On their way I was told to Hamburg, to a travelling menagerie. Where have they gone to? they wondered. The grass and the thorn trees, the rivers and water holes and blue mountains. The high sweet air over the plain has lifted and withdrawn. In the night where is the full moon? Does it dream of us? And I wished that they might die on the journey, both at the same time, so that not one of those noble heads that are now raised, surprised, over the edge of the case, against the blue sky of Mombasa, should be left to turn from one side to the other, all alone in Hamburg where no one will know what they know of Africa. We can meet in England sometimes. Or Paris. Or New York. Or Hamburg. I'm taking the plane around by Voy in the morning to look out some elephants. What about your books? Keep them. I have no place for them now anyway. I shall end up in a tent in the Masai Reserve, I expect. I'll take an orange, though. Take me with you. Just for the flight. Not this time. You bought an aeroplane, you said, to fly me over Africa. Yes. So I did. Who is going with you now? It's going to be a bit rough. I'll need to have Kamal with me in case we sleep in the bush. I have shot a lion. Indeed you have. Next time. He went off on Friday the 8th. Look out for me Thursday. I'll be back in time to have luncheon with you. Then he drove away, waving his arm to me. He did not come for Thursday luncheon. I sat on my packing case, waiting. It was as though the world had gone silent, or I deaf. I visited Nairobi, where I was shunned, as though our friends felt that touching me would burn their fingers. Then I heard the whispering of Dennis' name, and when I heard his name, I knew. The aeroplane had taken off from Voy. Suddenly it swayed, got into a spin, and came down like a bird swooping. As it hit the ground, it caught fire. The people who ran to it were stopped by the heat. When they got branches and earth and had thrown them on the fire, 
they found that the aeroplane had been all smashed up and the two people in it had been killed. In the fall, they say. An orange had rolled clear from the wreckage. It rained all the night before his funeral. Africa received him and would change him and make him one with herself. I sail to Denmark. After I had left Africa, Brewer wrote to me of a strange thing that had happened at Dennis's grave. There is Tana. Glad you're feeling better. All's different here, as you would imagine. And they mostly come now with cameras, not guns. And I have become very like an extinct wild animal myself. I thought you would like to know, though, that the Maasai have been seeing lions on Finch Hatton's grave. Apparently a lion and lioness come there and stand or lie on the grave for a long time. I suppose a level place in the Ngong Hills makes a good site for lions. From there they can have a view over the plain and the cattle and game on it. And, of course, your farm. On my farm in Africa, it happened often in the early morning that a very small herd boy would come into the dining room all by himself, stand for a long time in front of the cuckoo clock, its birds still shut away and silent, and address it in Kikuyu, in a slow, sing-song declaration of love, then gravely walk out again. And I wonder now if I too know a song of Africa, of the giraffe, and the African new moon lying on her back, of the oxen ploughing her fields, and the dark laughing faces of my totos as the bird leaps. Will Africa know a song of me? Will the air over the plain quiver with a colour I had on? Or the children invent a game in which my name is? Or the full moon throw a shadow over the gravel of the drive that is like me? Will the lions of Ngong then watch over me? In Out of Africa by Karen Blixen, dramatised by Judith Adams, Karen was played by Emma Fielding, Dennis Finch Hatton by Tom Goodman Hill, and Kamanti by Beru Tesima. Farah was played by Maynard Eziashi, Ishmael by Jude Akwudike, Emanuelson by Ian Batchelor, Wilhelm by Sean Baker, and Braw and Barclay by Sam Dale. The producer was Gaynor McFarlane.